Welcome, everyone. Uh, our talk today will be at least 40 minutes long, so I'll keep my introductory comments short and try and uh, start things off as soon as possible. Welcome to the second Library Lunchtime lecture for this semester. Our speaker, Professor Orhan Aitor, will deliver a, I should say, presentation rather than a uh, talk entitled Realm of the Coral, Color Camouflage, Consumption, Cleaning, and Courtship Under the Tropical Seas. Now there's a, a tongue twister if there ever was one, fine alliteration. Orhan Aitor has many hats to wear at Bill Kent. He is professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. He is associate provost, provost and he is also an underwater photographer, which is why he's here today. He started taking photography lessons when he was an undergraduate at Middle East Technical University in the 1980s and had his first photographs published at that time. During his doctoral studies at Northwestern University, he himself gave photography and darkroom classes. He started scuba diving in 1998 and started taking underwater photographs in the year 2000. And these photographs have received many, many awards, uh, international awards. You can look on the door outside, you will see a list of his awards there. Okay, I will finish there. A few little points to start, off, start us off. Shortly, we will be dimming the lights quite a lot in order to get maximum uh, effect of his fine photographs. So if you are concerned with the dark or something, you might wish to move this side. I'm sure everyone will be fine. As usual, could you please either switch off your cell phones or turn them to silent mode so we don't obviously interrupt uh, the uh, speech. And we're hoping to have five or maximum ten minutes at the end for questions. Uh, we'll put the lights back on after the presentation is finished. Okay, thank you very much. Orhan, please take the thank stage. You very much for the thank you. Ah, forget about that bit. Let me uh, don my microphone. Uh, can I have the lights on for a second while I make sure that I stick the uh, microphone thing to the right place? <laughs> and with the ventilation off and with your permission, get rid of my jacket. I was telling David well, how I had this uh, professor in graduate school who uh, uh, liked to tie and untie his shoelaces every five minutes. Uh, so I walk around quite a bit uh, uh, during the presentation. I don't tie my shoes, but... Okay, uh, today I'll be talking about corals. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to first talk about is what exactly uh, a coral. Corals live in marine environments uh, all over the world and pretty much uh, at all depths. Uh, corals are animals. They are strange animals in that... Um, they usually live in um, communities or colonies of genetically identical individuals that are connected to each other through some common tissue. Here you see two colonies. And if you look closely, uh, each colony is composed of individuals. Uh, an individual animal is called a coral polyp. And uh, it has its own set of internal and external organs and uh, by itself is considered to be a distinct animal but it is connected to its uh, uh, brothers and sisters uh, with some common tissue uh, a concept that is very uh, difficult to comprehend for us imagine everybody in this room to be connected through some live tissue that belongs to our collective um, there are also some solitary corals this is uh, uh, one example Corals live uh, on the seafloor. They don't move. They don't have the ability for lo locomation. They either are fixed, attached to the uh, bottom, bottom, or uh, they just sit there with gravity. Uh, here's the uh, typical body plan of a coral. There is a central opening, an orifice, which serves as the mouth and also as the place where uh, digested waste material is thrown out. So we have two, corals have one. Uh, and around this orifice uh, are a number of tentacles. Uh, the number of tentacles changes from species to species. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the next polyp and the next polyp, etc. Uh, here's a species, even though you see many of them, this is actually a solitary species. 
uh, the mouth is at the center and the tentacles on the sides. Now, what is special about corals is that on these tentacles are special cells that bear um, something called a, a nematocyst. And this nematocyst is uh, ac actually a little harpoon with its delivery mechanism. There's actually a coil, a physical coil. Uh, and there's also venom. When um, these cells uh, are externally touched, they are triggered to release this barbed harpoon. And there's also a venom uh, delivery system. So these are used both for defense and also for aggressively catching fish. Corals can catch fish and eat them. Uh, this particular coral species is called the fire coral. It's not red, it's not shaped in the uh, form of flames, it is called a fire coral because of the sensation it gives you when you touch it. It burns like hell. So um, this is uh, another coral and there are some uh, uh, relatives of corals. For example, the jellyfish is also a coral. It also has the same type of stinging cells. So when jellyfish sting, it's the same type of uh, nematocyst cells that uh, uh, burn you. Also, there is another animal called uh, a sea anemone. We'll be talking about sea anemones quite a bit uh, in today's talk. They are uh, very closely related to corals. Uh, here's a sea anemone that's maybe about 10-15 uh, centimeters high. Uh, it sits on the sea floor. This is its foot. It's not permanently attached. It can move, and sometimes it does move, but uh, most of the time it stays in one place. Uh, so this is the foot and the, uh, the beautifully decorated side walls, and there's a ring of tentacles, much like the uh, coral. They are also uh, nematocyst-bearing uh, tentacles. They also sting. And at the center, there's a mouth, which you cannot see in this picture. All of these animals are called cnidarians. The word comes from the Greek word nettle. Uh, so they, 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 are, they have stinging cells. Uh, let's briefly talk about anemones. This is a sea anemone, and uh, it is uh, uh, somewhat closed on itself because of the currents right now. And these two fish, and there are actually a few others over here too, uh, are uh, in a symbiotic relationship. They live together with this anemone. They are different species. When they live together, if uh, one is harmful to the other, we call it uh, a parasite. But uh, if they are uh, mutually beneficial to each other, we call that symbiosis. And uh, here's the uh, entire anemone. This is about maybe uh, 40, 50 centimeters across. There's a mouth right around here, uh, a single mouth. This is a single individual element, uh, animal. It's not a colony of animals. And uh, it's got these stinging tentacles. But this anemone fish, also called the clownfish at times, um, is immune to the uh, stinging cells of the anemone and uh, can actually use the anemone as its uh, host to retract to uh, when there's danger. Here's the mouth of the anemone. There are different kinds of anemones and there are different kinds of anemone fish. They don't all look the same. Uh, here's uh, uh, what is known as a false clownfish. Uh, again, in an anemone. And here's another, uh, I'm not sure what the official name is. We usually call it the tomato clownfish for the obvious reasons. Um, anyway, let's go back to corals. If, here's a colony of corals, around the central opening are uh, eight tentacles. These are called hexacorallia. They're also called soft corals. Now, soft coral is really a misnomer because sometimes they are 100% soft and sometimes they do have a hard skeleton, as in the case of this Gorgonian sea fan, which is a soft coral. So the technical distinction is the number of uh, tentacles, uh, but um, in everyday uh, parlance, we talk about these things as soft corals. Uh, this is uh, also a soft coral. If you look at it closely, you see the individual uh, polyps. Now, um, this particular soft coral, uh, beautiful, it, uh, each individual little flower is a polyp, a separate animal, as I was saying, and this is the uh, common tissue that all of them are connected to, which in this case there are no uh, hard parts. These little uh, pins uh, are called spicules and they are of calcium carbonate and it gives some structural integrity to the whole thing, which uh, essentially sits by a hydrostatic, sits erect uh, with hydrostatic pressure. It comes in 
beautiful colors. Very many different varieties. This is essentially the kind of coral that gives soft corals its uh, uh, name. Okay, let's talk a little bit about if there are soft corals, then there are hard corals. Uh, the distinction is uh, hard corals have either six or uh, an integer multiple of six, usually many tentacles. Uh, and uh, they form uh, an external skeleton, which is also a common tissue, so they share the same skeleton. Uh, the external skeleton is called an exoskeleton. Um, and uh, uh, for that reason, they are sometimes called stony corals, hard corals or stony corals. In this picture, each little dot is the site of a polyp, uh, and this entire structure was secreted. It's a calcium carbonate structure uh, secreted by the colony, and it grows with the colony as individuals grow asexually. Now, this is uh, maybe uh, 50 centimeters across, uh, is a single colony of a particular hard coral. The polyps themselves cannot be seen in this picture. They are probably retracted into their tiny holes, which is what I want to talk about next. Um, this is again another hard coral, the skeleton part. Uh, each, there are many hundreds of species, and each species, of course, builds a different type of uh, skeleton. Now, let's look at this particular species. Uh, this, uh, when this photo was taken, the individual polyps are all retracted into the skeleton and they're not visible. So everything you see here is basically the skeleton. It's, it's hard, it's stone, it's not really living matter. Uh, it is the skeleton of the, uh, of the uh, coral uh, community. Now, at the center of each ring is a tiny dot. And in that dot, uh, in that hole lives a coral polyp. Now, at night or whenever the uh, uh, currents are favorable, they come out to feed. And the transformation is amazing. Uh, the entire surface is covered with living tissue. At the center is the mouth, and around the mouth are the uh, tentacles that gather uh, food particles. As you can see, there are, uh, we have more than eight tentacles, so this is a hard coral. Now, another very, very important thing about hard corals is uh, another strange concept. They have symbiotic single-celled algae. Algae are single-celled, uh, you can think of them as seaweeds. They do uh, photosynthesis. And these single-celled seaweeds are actually living inside the cells of the coral. And these uh, symbiotic algae are what give um, hard corals, their characteristic colors. If the sea temperature raises uh, a couple of degrees uh, due to global warming or a uh, seasonal El Nino effect, then sometimes these uh, symbiotic algae die and the coral, and the coral loses its uh, color. This is called coral bleaching. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the sex life of uh, corals. Uh, they do reproduce uh, sexually. Uh, and uh, in a, a spectacular event uh, called coral spawning, corals in a particular area carefully timed with the uh, uh, phases of the moon and the currents in that area release eggs and sperm into the water column uh, where they meet each other and a larvae uh, uh, forms uh, and the larvae may float with the currents for maybe weeks before settling on a suitable substrate to start a single polyp which asexually divides to uh, an entire colony of genetically identical individuals. So um, the uh, symbiotic algae, algae uh, provide a very important mechanism. Um, I forgot to uh, go into the details of that. Uh, the algae uh, does photosynthesis, so it takes carbon dioxide uh, from inside the cells of the uh, coral uh, and it uses sunlight to produce sugars and complex carbon molecules uh, and also water as a byproduct. Uh, now these sugars are actually used by the coral. A typical hard coral gets 90% of its energy eating by direct ingestion. In return, it gives the algae a home, a place to live inside its own body. It also gives the algae carbon dioxide, which is a very necessary ingredient for uh, photosynthesis. 
So corals grow where there is a lot of sunlight. You find corals all over the world, but the realm of the coral is the tropics. The reason in the tropics you have clear water, in the tropics you have a lot of sunlight, and corals can grow very quickly, hard corals that is. So here's a hard coral boulder. This is called table coral. It is about two meters across. So you can't obviously see the individual uh, polyps right now uh, because there are uh, literally uh, tens of thousands of them in a single colony. Uh, similar table coral from the top with a wide angle lens. There are hundreds of different uh, varieties, species of uh, uh, corals and depending on, the, on a particular location, uh, they cover uh, the entire um, sea bottom. In this case, lettuce coral uh, in the Red Sea. Uh, this single coral colony is several meters high. So they can grow to be quite large and quite old, several thousands of years of old. Uh, th this is probably only a few hundreds of years old, but it can grow to uh, more than a thousand years old. Um, this is a Toyota truck that fell off uh, a, a ship called the Blue Belt uh, when uh, some Sudanese decided that uh, they could steal some, some, some trucks. Anyway, it's a long story. I won't go into that. This truck was sank uh, together with the, the, uh, uh, hundreds of others uh, in 1977. So this piece of table coral grew from the tire of the truck. Uh, this photo was taken two years ago. Uh, so from 1977 to 2007. This is another Toyota truck. You can see that it is entirely covered with uh, not only corals, but other seaweeds and things. Anything left in the water for a while gets covered with life. And um, of course, if it's a tropical area and there's a lot of sunlight, usually corals dominate. But even in the cargo of uh, a ship, you can find a 1939 Fiat. This is in Sudan. Uh, this is right at the beginning of the, on the very day that the Italians decided that they wanted to uh, get into World War II, um, uh, they had to sink a ship called Umbria, and uh, this 1939 Fiat has been sitting in its cargo hold uh, ever since. Um, and this is the captain's toilet. <laughs> anyway, back to corals. So stony corals, or hard corals, uh, grow in tropical areas and they can grow fast and generations upon generation they build these reefs they build these coral reefs the entire they change the entire geography this reef in the red sea is several hundred meters across i took this photo from the top of a, a lighthouse uh, this is called daedalus reef uh, where you see green or brown is water that's only a meter deep and where you see the deep blue is uh, deep water and this is uh, the drop off where uh, the edge of the reef drops to several hundred uh, meters deep. This entire structure was built by corals. It is generations on generations of corals uh, excreting these hard skeletons and um, the hard skeletons eroding with tides and uh, fish nibbling at them etc. that built this humongous piece of geography. It also builds islands called coral islands. This entire island was built. The, the sand that you see, it's actually actual mushed up coral. It's just uh, coral that was mushed up with erosion and whatnot. So around these coral reefs live many creatures. The whole ecosystem depends on the coral. The very substrate on which everything else lives is made of dead coral. We see a lot of colorful uh, fish. This uh, fish is called Antias. And uh, these little green fish retreat into the uh, crevices of the coral whenever there is danger. Corals provide um, shelter for all these little fish in the coral community. This is uh, a mushroom coral and a, a fish called the pipefish that lives exclusively in this coral. This fish lives nowhere else but inside, well, I shouldn't say inside, but 
in, within the arms of this coral, because when I say in, inside, maybe I mean in the uh, tissue itself, but uh, uh, in the branches. Uh, this squirrel fish uh, is active at night, is just resting during the day. This hawkfish is waiting for its next uh, meal to swim by so it can uh, catch it. Another hawkfish. Because the visibility is so good in tropical waters, color carries a lot of information. Color is good to let your friends know who you are and let your enemies know you, uh, who you are. But sometimes cryptic patterns are necessary to, for camouflage as well. So color is used both for uh, recognition and also for uh, camouflage. Hiding the eye is a typical uh, camouflage mechanism. Uh, or swimming in strange ways is another. Uh, this thing, uh, these fish called razor fish uh, swim uh, uh, upside down. Schooling is another behavior that uh, helps fish uh, ward off predators. These are goatfish. Uh, in, in Turkey we have, uh, they are related to barbun. And the big eyes. These are called the batfish for a reason I, that I can't understand. Uh, the name of this fish is sweet lips. You can see why. <laughs> And this is uh, a variety of, uh, of, of wrasse. There are many different wrasses uh, around the coral reefs. This is a leaf fish. And this fish is one of the most aptly named fish in the, in the ocean. It's called the Picasso trigger fish. <laughs> Only Picasso could have thought of something like this. A banner fish. Uh, this is the masked butterfly fish. There are many butterfly fishes, uh, and the, the mask, again, conceals the eye. And, uh, uh, of course, with my lights and everything, fish look more conspicuous than they really are. Having false eyes helps a lot. This box puffer fish has a lot of them. It, uh, you can't really tell which one is an eye and which one is just a black dot. And the blue variety. The moray eel, there are uh, a few different species, uh, is uh, a nocturnal hunter. <coughs> this is the pepper moray. The lizard fish, another predator fish. Okay, um, this thing is a wire coral. And I wanted to give this as an example as to uh, how corals can be host to so many different creatures. The wire coral is about as thick as your index finger. And it can be um, only uh, uh, 30, 40 centimeters long, or it can be more than 200, uh, 2 meters long. It grows with one end attached to the substrate and the other end just sticking out or sideways. On the whip coral live small fish. This is a whip coral goby. It lives, it spends its entire life on this coral. So it's got a mate as well on the coral. This ugly creature is a uh, crab that lives only on the wire coral. A brief encounter with uh, a fish. Again, the uh, whip coral crab. Here's the eye. Since the eye is white, it's difficult to make it out. Uh, a shrimp. These are not the kind of shrimp that we eat. These are uh, very tiny shrimp that live exclusively on these wire corals. And the smallest of the bunch in these pictures is this. This is smaller than uh, uh, half the nail of your pinky. Just maybe three or four millimeters at most. Um, also living Within the coral branches are other crustaceans, such as this crab, or this crab. This is a sea pan, a relative of, of corals, that the backdrop. Uh, can you guess the name of this crab? It's called the orangutan crab. <laughs> 
Now, uh, if you don't want to be eaten, or if you're a predator and you want to get close to your prey without being noticed, camouflage is very important. Here we see a fan coral, and on the fan coral is a crab. This is one eye, this is the other eye, and you can see both the coloration and the texture of the crab match the uh, coral perfectly. So the crab can live on this coral without being detected. Unless it moves, it's very difficult to detect. Being transparent also helps. There is a transparent shrimp here. This is the tail. These are the two eyes. You can only make out uh, the legs a little bit. The entire body is transparent. This is a juvenile pipefish. It also is uh, largely transparent and has some cryptic coloring. It's very difficult to see. This wire coral goby is also transparent. This is a soft coral with a tiny, tiny crab. It has the same coloration and texture as its host, so these are very difficult to see. A cowrie, uh, a beautiful animal, again, very small. These are the little, uh, this is as thick as a pin, uh, so you can uh, tell how small this, this animal is. It's a shelled mollusk, basically. Another one, of course, different color coral, so different uh, color um, cowrie. Uh, these creatures are related to segmented worms, the earthworms. Uh, they look much prettier. They are called Christmas tree worms, again for obvious reasons. They have a tube that they can retract into. And this pygmy seahorse. Now, uh, this seahorse, the eye and the body, uh, is clinging to um, a sea fan, a coral, with its tail. In most of my pictures, you're not going to be able to tell how big or how small an animal is. Uh, let me tell you, most of them are very small. In this case, I have an example. It's an index finger in the back. So this animal is only a few millimeters long. They are perfectly camouflaged. Even if you know that there is a seahorse on a particular fan, you may spend 20 minutes and not find it. A different kind of uh, pygmy seahorse. And you can see how well the colors match uh, the host coral. And the yellow kind. There are two. Um, this is a, uh, an ornate ghost pipe fish, a pretty long name. Uh, again, uh, swimming near this coral, uh, it is very difficult to see because the coloration and the texture is very similar. You don't always have to be pretty to, uh, for camouflage to work. Uh, you can try to look like a coral or you can try to look like a stone covered with uh, gunk. So here's the stone and here's the fish the eyes and the mouth. It's a scorpion fish. On this coral block are five feather stars. These are related to uh, sea stars, uh, but they are different animals. Uh, they have uh, this claw with which they hang on to uh, corals, and they have these feather-like arms with which they collect uh, water from, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, food particles from the water column. Uh, this animal itself is an ecosystem in itself because other animals live in it. This shrimp, uh, called uh, an emperor commensal shrimp, uh, is yellow because its host is yellow. If its host were red and white, it would be red and white. If its host were yellow, again here, here's the red and white example. And this is an extremely interesting phenomenon. The larvae of this uh, shrimp settle on a particular um, uh, crinoid, that is a uh, feather star, and then uh, not, like a, not unlike a chameleon, but in a much slower, weeks-long process, assumes the same shape, uh, I mean the same texture and color. This one is very difficult to see, the eyes, the body. See the tips of the feathers are yellow and the eyes of the shrimp are yellow. 
to, to mimic that. This is adaptation at its best. Even some fish live within the arms of the uh, feather star. A tiny crab. Let's go back to the anemones. Remember the anemone fish or the clownfish uh, lives within the stingy tentacles of the uh, sea anemone. Other uh, creatures, here a little uh, transparent shrimp and two uh, crabs also live in the anemone community. There are very many different animals that live within the uh, um, protective arms of the anemone. This is called a porcelain crab. The backdrop here is the uh, underside, the, the side wall of, of an anemone. Very beautiful. And a tiny, tiny shrimp also living inside an anemone. The blue background is a sea star, a regular sea star. The uh, sh color is interesting, it's blue. And then two shrimp that have the same coloration and one is even transparent to boot. And this shrimp lives only on an animal called uh, a basket star. So we see these relationships, symbiosis, uh, two animals that are locked to each other, always found together. This uh, sea urchin, uh, called a fire urchin, this time both because of its color and also its stinging spines, is host to this particular shrimp called the Coleman shrimp, um, which was discovered only in the 1970s, I believe, or maybe 80s. Also living underwater are uh, sponges. Sponges are also animals. They live attached to the sea substrate. They filter the water uh, for uh, particular uh, fo uh, food. And um, uh, they are the simplest kind of uh, animals, really. They don't have uh, organs, but they are considered animals because they uh, ingest their food and they, ha they are multicellular with some specialized cells, but no, no organs, really. This is called a barrel sponge. It, is, uh, it can be uh, one or one and a half meters uh, in size. And within the crevices of the barrel coral uh, live, again, many fish and crabs. And uh, this one is actually called a squat lobster. Uh, it's like a crab, the hairy squat lobster. These creatures are called skeleton shrimp. And these are the tiniest things I'm going to show you today. Uh, they are less than a millimeter in uh, thickness. Uh, this is, again, on a sponge. And this is a hydroid. Uh, and uh, they're extremely difficult to photograph. I have hundreds of uh, out-of-focus photographs just for two photographs in focus. Uh, now, if you are not well camouflaged, you can um, find a remedy. This crab is called the decorator crab. It snips off pieces of the coral and sticks it on its body as decoration. <laughs> and it can be very effective. There is a crab here, a different kind of crab. This is one eye, this is another eye. It's completely covered with gunk. And this is a sponge crab. This is also very small, you can tell from the little pieces of sand. Uh, and it has uh, a, a sponge, uh, like a cap, and always it can kneel down and be invisible, hide under the sponge that it carries on its back. And of course, if you're red, then you find the red sponge. And if you want to be, uh, uh, if you want to hide being small and hanging around uh, Seaweed also helps. Uh, this is a juvenile fish, juvenile trigger fish that is hiding. Uh, these little bubbles of seaweed are maybe two millimeters or three millimeters at most. This is also a very small animal called a bobtail squid. It's related to squids and octopuses. Uh, these are just pieces of grains of sand. You can tell how small this is, and it's got beautiful iridescent coloration. Speaking of octopuses, or octopi, whichever you prefer, they are masters of camouflage. They have special cells that allow them to change color instantly. 
and blend into their surroundings. And of course, if you want to hide, you can always duck. <laughs> the eye of the octopus is very well developed. This is uh, a squid. Squids also have uh, these chromatophores that uh, they use to change their colors and patterns. They also communicate with each other with these colors and patterns that they produce. They warn uh, attackers and uh, they certainly d uh, put out uh, qu quite a display to an underwater photographer or filmmaker. Uh, not all of tropics is uh, coral made. There are, there's also another strong force of uh, nature, the volcanoes. So we see, especially around the Ring of Fire in uh, Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, we see a lot of reefs, also coral reefs, but dominated with uh, volcanic residues. Here the sand is black. So the origin of the sand is not uh, mushed up coral, it's mushed up volcanic ash. And we see, again, creatures of the most bizarre shapes and colors. Uh, let me repeat, there, these animals are not as conspicuous as uh, they s seem to be in these pictures because of the uh, strong lights I'm shining on them a shrimp. And these are tiny solitary corals out of focus in the back. This animal is a shrimp. It's called the mantis shrimp. And these two eyes are the most advanced eyes in the world, in the animal kingdom. They have 13 different photoreceptors. They can uh, see polarized light. Some varieties burrow into the sand. Look at the eyes. And uh, here's a crab, a mollusk, a ribbon eel. And a seahorse. Not all of them are very pretty. <laughs> a lizard fish. Formidable set of teeth. And some pipefish, very well camouflaged. Again, the idea here is camouflage. This is a scorpion fish, and if it needs to scare you, it can always do this. Okay, let me uh, speed up a little bit with the ugly things. This animal has even camouflage on its eye. An octopus in a half coconut shell. Uh, this hermit crab uh, doesn't have a shell of its own. It carries uh, empty shells and as protection, it has bodyguards. These are little anemones with the stinging cells that it places on its shell. And this crab has a sea urchin uh, on its back. This is again symbiosis. This fish and this uh, shrimp live in the same hole. The shrimp is a good excavator and the uh, fish is a good lookout and they uh, live together. And some shrimp on uh, a sea cucumber. An eel, complete, almost completely buried in sand. A lionfish, a poisonous fish. Um, here we see a sponge, and on the sponge, the same color, the same texture, is a fish called a frogfish. Let's look at it closer. Here's the uh, mouth, the eye, and the body. Let me move back. They come in all sorts of different colors. The hairy frogfish, the sargassum frogfish. 
They are also called anglerfish. It's got a fishing rod with a bait, and this is how it uses it to attract small fish. It's camouflaged itself, and then it, the fish come, and they are hoovered in with this uh, mouth, and this is the thing that the fish last sees before being eaten. <laughs> a hungry moray eel. And a pa it's eating a parrotfish. Some parrotfish build a cocoon uh, of mucus uh, as uh, protection to, uh, uh, they, so that their scent doesn't travel. They excrete it from their mouth. The blue-spotted uh, stingray. Uh, fishing for mollusks in the sand. The titan triggerfish. And uh, the mimic octopus, also a voracious uh, predator. This octopus is eating the contents of a shell. And these shrimp, this is called the harlequin shrimp, another aptly named creature. Uh, they can eat uh, these blue stars that we talked about earlier. The porcelain crab. Uh, this is a tunicate. It, like sponges, it filters uh, seawater for uh, bits of food. As uh, a larval form, it has a backbone, so it's classified as a chordate. And the sea cucumber licks its fingers for food. <laughs> and this is called shadow feeding. This predator is hiding behind the larger herbivore so other fish don't notice it coming close by. <laughs> the same uh, strategy used by another fish, this time hiding behind the jellyfish. Uh, a poisonous lionfish. Uh, the most venomous creature in the seas, a sea snake. Uh, now let's look at a few blue water predators, the jack. The barracudas, also schooling predators, and of course the sharks. Look at the coral background. The shark has some uh, uh, remora fish attached to its uh, underbelly. They live off of the scra uh, scraps uh, from the shark's meals. And this is a silky shark. This is called a wobegong. It uh, looks more like an old uh, rag, but it's actually a shark. And this is the eye of a cat shark. Mantas, even though they are large, they are filter feeders. They live off of plankton in the water column. So it's important to have a nice home, even though sometimes it's man-made. <laughs> Something to hide in. And for these garden eels, it's the sand. They can just retract into the sand. Sand is like water to them. And this is why they are called garden eels. It looks like a garden. A mollusk with a set of eyes. It carries its own shell for protection. And of course, the, so does the turtle. It carries its own shell for protection. So does uh, the clam. And if you don't have anything for protection, you can always swallow a lot of water and make yourself big. This is the puffer fish. Uh, let's quickly talk about um, uh, sea slugs. These are like uh, uh, sea, uh, snails, but uh, they don't have uh, a shell. They don't have eyes, they have these rhinophores, and this is their breeding apparatus their gills, they come in an amazing array of colors. This is the mouth, and they eat, each one specializes in eating something else. Here's another uh, example of symbiosis, two very large shrimp living on uh, a uh, nudibranch. 
a sea slug. And so is this living on a sea slug. Its entire world is this sea slug. <coughs> cleaning is important. These fish stay at places called cleaning stations and they provide cleaning services to larger fish, cleaning them of their parasites and uh, of uh, bits and pieces of food. It can be quite daring. <laughs> Look at this. It's completely inside the, uh, uh, the fish. So the agreement is that they won't be eaten. <laughs> Even barracuda stop by to be cleaned. And this huge fish is the sunfish, the oceanic sunfish. You need many fish to clean it. And uh, sometimes shrimp also do some cleaning on this eel. And if you stick your finger, they'll also do a manicure job on your fingers as well. <laughs> See the loose bits of skin there? Okay, this is the bedroom of two uh, uh, gobbies getting ready to mate with proper decoration. <laughs> the female lays off the eggs and the, uh, on the bottom and the male is waiting to uh, inseminate them. These two mandarin fish, uh, exactly at 6.15 every day, uh, they raise from the coral rubble and they uh, bump in mid-water for uh, just a few seconds, releasing sperm and eggs into the water. Uh, remember this coral? Well, it's got a predator, this uh, shelled mollusk. It has a special organ that it sticks into the tube eats the coral, and then lays its eggs in it, combining food and sex. Here's some octopus love. Um, some group activities. <laughs> Again, group uh, egg laying. These are the, these are the eggs. Uh, and this creature is a squid, is a cuttlefish. It lays its eggs in a half coconut shell and you can see the embryo inside the uh, coconut, sh uh, inside the egg and this is after it hatches. And uh, last but not least, this is uh, the sex organ of the uh, sea slug. Uh, it's actually got two parts, something that sticks out and a little hole here. They're all hermaphrodites. They are both um, female and male at the same time, so when they two, when two meet, they don't quibble about who is male or who is female. They give sperm to each other and they separate. Uh, here you can, it's a little bit pornographic, but... Uh, uh, and then they separate and they lay eggs separately. And here's a clownfish taking care of its eggs. And uh, the uh, mantis shrimp with a clutch of eggs Again, a crab with its clutch of eggs. And uh, this cardinal fish is incubating its eggs in its mouth. So we dive and we admire the colors of the ocean and the creatures and we admire the camouflage. And we realize that they need homes like we do. And they sometimes look, out, uh, they look at the world, world from their porch, just uh, uh, have the day go by. They have to eat. They have to get cleaned, and they have to sleep once in a while. Companionship is important. Uh, so is a little bit of uh, intimacy. And then animals also like to play with their young, like these dolphins do. Uh, and what we do is we dive, and we explore, and then maybe with the things we abstract. We uh, try to extract some abstract images from these. And uh, I believe these are the kind of qualities that uh, really sets us, up, uh, sets us apart from the rest of the animals. And these are also the same qualities, uh, exploration and the ability for abstract thought, that has led uh, Charles Darwin and Russell Wallace to uh, come up with the mechanism, uh, the natural force behind the diversity that we so much admire today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having
Matt, for that visual feast. Fascinating, both visually, as I say, but also intellectually, and uh, I've learned a lot Thank of you. that. I'm sure everyone else has. We've pretty much come up to our stopping time, so if those of you who need to get to a class or something, please feel free to leave. But beforehand, can answer a couple of questions yes. if anyone has anything pressing about sharks or something. Uh, well, yeah. In Turkey, this is difficult to, to find because this is a tropical talk only. In Turkey, you can dive in Kash, Kalkan, and North Aegean is also very beautiful. And you'll see also very colorful and very nice things. But uh, this talk was based on co uh, tropical coral reefs. For this, you need to, the closest point is the Red Sea, and even better, go to the Maldives or uh, to Indonesia. Most of these photos were taken in Indonesia, the Red Sea, uh, some in Maldives, uh, the Philippines, uh, the Southeast Asia in general. Yes. Are you publishing these? No, I'm looking for a publisher, for a sponsor to, to publish these things. It's always a... Well, well, I hope so. If you have any contacts, please help me. Any other questions? Yes. Um, my lights are flashes, so once they see them, uh, the picture is already taken. But getting close to animals is a big part of this. Each animal has its comfort zone, and it's not easy getting close to them. It's not easy to photograph them when they are doing their own thing. Usually when an animal sees you, even if it's a two-meter shark, they run away. So uh, underwater photography, most of it has to do with how to approach which animal and what is the comfort zone for the animal and how to make sure that the animal is uh, doing what it's supposed to do instead of being frightened of you. Good question. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, you see colorful fish mostly in the tropics where there's a lot of sunlight. But it's a question that is not 100% answered because some uh, deep living fish are red and there's no red in the deep. It's all black. So you, nobody really knows why they have red pigments. So it's, a, it's an open question. But color in general is, and, and pattern is used for communication, uh, for uh, telling, publishing who you are and also warding off uh, maybe attackers, and sometimes uh, some cryptic patterning is used for camouflage. And mostly, they look very beautiful to us. So they are. How, how do you explain that? Well, um, <laughs> I just try to enjoy it, uh, <laughs> rather than explain it. But this is what I like about underwater uh, photography and diving so much. If you are interested in land animals, and if you want to see a giraffe, you have to go to South uh, Africa, and if you uh, see a giraffe from three kilometers with a pair of binoculars, you are happy. Uh, whereas with all these fascinating cre creatures, I can get right up to them and take their photos. Uh, so in most of the photo photography, I'm within centimeters of what I'm uh, taking a photo of. The bleaching of the coral that you mentioned, what is that, what is, how, is that, how does that happen? Um, basically, uh, it's a combined effect of its water temperatures rising either because of global warming or because of some seasonal uh, periodic El Nino type effects. Uh, the um, symbiotic algae die, uh, so the corals stop growing or they grow very, very slowly. Sometimes the algae comes back uh, after many years, but sometimes entire patches uh, of coral is bleached. So right now we are in a situation uh, with global warming and everything where very large patches uh, are completely bleached uh, and this is an environmental disaster that people are trying to come to grips with. Uh, in recorded history there, there's been no other time when there was so much, much uh, coral bleaching. Part of it is natural, it happens every now and then, but now it's, the extent is too much. Uh, how can a, a clownfish, for example, contribute or support to the life of a coral? Well, is there a reciprocity. Um, part of it is cleaning because uh, the uh, animal uh, cannot clean itself and there is bits and pieces of food which rot. So you don't want all of that rotting bits and food. So it, by uh, picking it up, it cleans uh, the animal. Uh, if it's not mutually beneficial, if the animal fish uh, doesn't do any harm but doesn't hurt either, we have a special name for that as well. We call that commensal. Uh, which means it's beneficial for one party 
and the party doesn't care. The other party doesn't care. Um, I don't really know. Not the kind of places where I go. I mean, I dive in the Marmara Sea, which obviously is polluted to an extent, and I see all these creatures that love polluted water. Uh, pollution doesn't necessarily mean everything dying, but of course the balance of nature shifting in such a way that some species uh, are better off and some are worse off. Pollution is a big problem, but I think in, the, in our seas right now, the number one problem is overfishing. Uh, the number of uh, sharks that, that are being mutilated for their fins, uh, the uh, tuna in the Mediterranean is almost gone now. So overfishing is actually the number one um, enemy right now, Mo much, much more than pollution. Uh, there's, there's a lot of water, but there's also a lot of uh, people. Um, it is an acquired immunity. It's not from birth, uh, uh, but uh, there's, um, I'm not sure about the details, but a, uh, a small clownfish sort of becomes accustomed to the uh, uh, stinging cells by gradually acclimatizing itself, by rubbing to the uh, anemone and then retracting over a matter of weeks. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 100% known but it's, uh, there's an initiation period. It's not automatic. Um, there also community life is very interesting. Uh, in one anemone, there's one male and a lot of females, and when the male dies, one of the females ter uh, change its sex to become a male. So it's all um, concepts of sex are very different. Yeah, it is very useful. <laughs> not as useful as the... Uh, uh, the situation where they are both males and females, as in the case of sea slugs. So uh, they don't have eyes, they are crawling on the sea floor. So, I mean, it would be really unfortunate for two females or two males uh, getting together and not being able to reproduce. So nature has taken care of that problem by making all of them both male and female. Can they actually stop me? Uh, no, you saw the thing. It needs to come out and go back in. It's difficult. I, are they, uh, they don't do that. Can't do that. If there are no more questions, let me thank the library for inviting me uh, to this wonderful event. And uh, at, at any time you, ca you catch me with more questions of the underwater world, diving or underwater photography, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, I will say thank you to uh, Orhan again and also to the library staff who worked very hard to get things ready for today. My last word, in five weeks' time, on the 16th of December, our third and final library lecture for this semester, Dr. Dilek Kaya Mudlu from the Graphic Design uh, Department will be speaking on the history of censorship in Turkish cinema, the censorship of religion as a case. I hope to see you all there then. Thank you very much. And I'm glad I got my talk over before the censorship people came here. <laughs> <laughs>